You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com It's right over by Akron Canton. We need people help. I mean, do we have a cell phone? I do. You guys see, like, we don't know what it is. No, I heard I the plane the going plane down plane. and then the explosion. That was awful. Can you smell it? Yeah. Look at all the smoke. Dude, right, th- right here? Right no, here. It's, no, it's right there. It's in this guy's backyard. Yeah. Go so over. We can't just sit in the okay. backyard. Get... This is as close as we can get. Welcome to episode 226 of the Corbett Report podcast Crashes of Convenience, Michael Connell. What you've just been listening to is the audio of a rather harrowing video, which is the documentation of the first eyewitnesses on the scene of a rather harrowing plane crash that took place in Akron, Ohio, back in 2008. And you can go and watch that video if you would like to, and you can watch all 10 minutes of that video in which the participants, the the first people on the scene there, document basically the uh, the plane in flames and uh, they call 911 and the people begin to arrive to start putting out the fire and that is the unfortunate ending of the flight of N9299N a Piper aircraft that went down on December 19th 2008 killing the pilot and if you go to ntsb.gov the website of the National Transportation Safety Board you can find a factual report which was filed in the wake of this incident and which interestingly enough was modified on January 26th of 2010 talking about the history of the flight the personnel information the aircraft admin information etc and just reading from the opening of this document quote On December 19th, 2008, about 1753 Eastern Standard Time, a Piper PA-32R-3110 N9299N impacted terrain during a precision approach to runway 23. A post-crash fire then ensued, destroying the airplane. The airplane impacted the front lawn of a vacant house about two miles east-northeast from Akron-Canton Regional Airport, CAK, Akron, Ohio. Night instrument meteorological conditions prevailed at the time of the accident. The pilot was fatally injured, and there were no ground injuries. The flight departed from College Park Airport, CGS, College Park, Maryland, about 1531, and was returning to CAK at the time of the accident. End quote. And as that report does indicate, yes, the pilot did die during the crash and was the only one injured on the scene. So as tragic as any and every such loss of life undoubtedly is, why are we concentrating on it in today's episode of the broadcast? Well, let's leave the answer to that up to 19 Action News in Ohio, which had this broadcast at the time of the accident. Our conspiracy theorists in Washington, D.C. to say that an Ohio man with White House connections was actually murdered this weekend. New at 6, here's Night Action News investigator Scott Taylor to tell us if it's true or not. Well, this sounds like a made-up story. One man rigging state elections to help his boss, President George Bush. After it's done, power players in Washington say, get rid of the guy. Do I believe it? No, for now. 45-year-old Michael Connell died Friday night after his plane crashed into this vacant house near Union Township in Stark County. Connell was a political power player in Washington, D.C. and in the White House. He was the vision behind President George Bush's and John McCain's Internet sites. Initial reports say bad weather could have played a part in the crash. I guess the plane just flew apart. Some in Washington have a different opinion. The website Velvet Revolution believes someone sabotaged Connell's plane. It appears he was trying to land the plane here. He hit a large flagpole, and then he struck the house. Velvet Revolution claims to have been tipped off that Connell's life was in danger. Who was threatening Connell? According to the website, a senior advisor of President Bush, Karl Rove. Some say Connell was about to reveal embarrassing details involving senior members of the Bush administration, including their involvement in destroying incriminating emails and rigging elections. Connell died on impact 
and was only three miles away from the Akron Canton Airport. He was an experienced pilot. Was it an accident or murder? It's really hard to believe. I, I, I really don't know the full story of it. I just heard what I've seen in the paper and, and on the news. I spoke to Michael's family today in person. They are grieving. A visitation is planned for tonight. Many from his neighborhood say this was a very good man who donated his time to the worldwide community and loved his family very much. Scott Taylor, 19 Action News. Well, thank you, 19 Action News investigative reporter Scott Taylor for telling us that you don't believe in this crazy conspiracy theory. At least, not yet. Yes, some crack investigative journalism there, I'm sure, but uh, at any rate, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Taylor will keep you informed as, as, as to the status of his belief system on a regular basis if you want to continue following 19 Action News. But let's move along. So we have the bare bones of a story here, a potential political thriller that ties back to someone with ties to, to Bush himself and the rigging of the 2004 presidential election, specifically in Ohio. A very interesting story, and the more you start to dig, as with so many of these stories, the more very interesting information is uncovered. So I guess if you want the bare-bones basics of this story and what some of the allegations are, let's just uh, stick to a uh, boring, milk-toast, white-bread conspiracy-less website at cbsnews.com, where there's uh, just the, the facts as they were being reported at the time of this crash. So in February of 2009... A full two months after the crash, it should be noted, the CBS uh, filed this report, Republican IT guru dies in plane crash. And just reading from the section of that report dealing specifically with Michael Connell and his ties to the Bush administration, it says, quote, Beginning as a political campaign worker and congressional staffer, Connell became a key Republican media consultant who developed internet strategies for the 2000 and 2004 Bush-Cheney campaigns. He was founder and CEO of Cleveland-based New Media Communications, which built websites for President Bush and former presidential nominee John McCain, according to the company's website. He was also chief IT consultant for Karl Rove. Connell's ties to the Bush family extend back to working on campaigns for George H.W. Bush and former Florida governor Jeb Bush, for whom he built the campaign site Jeb.org. In 1999, he told the Cleveland, Cleveland magazine Inside Business, I'm loyal to my network. I'm loyal to my friends, and I'm loyal to the Bush family. He was also quoted as saying, when asked to predict the Internet's role in the upcoming presidential race, there are things we will be doing on Election Day that haven't even been dreamt of yet. The rise of the Republican Party in Washington in the 90s, and especially after the 2000 election, meant that Connell's network of connections was expanding as well. Having worked with Ohio Congressman Bob Ney and Governor Bob Taft, Connell's IT skills were sought after for the campaigns and congressional sites for dozens of GOP candidates and office holders. The New Media Communications website, now turned off with a memorial to Connell in its place, boasted, New Media's client list reads like a who's who of Republican politicians. In 2000, Connell co-founded with his wife Heather GovTech Solutions to pursue government contracts. GovTech's clients for databases, content management systems, and other services included the White House, the Energy Department, several Republican-led congressional committees, and a few dozen congressional members' websites. The Center for Public Integrity reported that in 2002 and 2004, the General Services Administration allowed federal agencies to purchase services directly from GovTech without a full bidding process. In 2004, Connell helped form an online advertising firm called Connell Donatelli, which administered the website for Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, a 527 developed to attack Democratic presidential nominee John Kerry. Connell's central role in building the IT infrastructure of the White House and his association with Karl Rove has brought him into the controversy surrounding missing White House emails relating to the firing of U.S. attorneys and other topics, and the fate of email communications sent by Rove and other administration staffers, which were sent via a Republican Party website, gwb43.com, rather than through a whitehouse.gov address. Connell built the GWB43.com site, which shares mail servers with GovTech. Connell's internet expertise also led him to be subpoenaed earlier this year to testify in an Ohio federal court regarding alleged voter fraud in the 2004 election. Despite exit polls showing a lead by Democratic nominee John Kerry of more than 4%, Mr. Bush won the state's vote by 2.5%, along with its crucial electoral votes. 
Much has been written about problems at the polls in Ohio that year, where voters in many predominantly Democratic precincts were forced to wait hours because of a shortage of working voting machines. A lawsuit being pursued by attorney Clifford Arnebeck seeks to answer questions about this and other ballot problems. For example, in Franklin County, Mr. Bush received 4,258 votes in a precinct where only 638 voters cast ballots. Questions have also been raised about how votes from Ohio counties were tabulated. Computer expert Stephen Spoonamore, a Republican who works in detecting fraud in network architecture and protecting computer infrastructures, has testified that the Ohio election returns he saw were indicative of a kingpin attack in which a computer is inserted into the communications flow of an IT system with the intent to change data as it passes to its destination. It was later learned that Ohio Secretary of State Kenneth Blackwell's office had routed internet traffic from county election offices through out-of-state servers based at SmartTech in Chattanooga, Tennessee. SmartTech hosts dozens of GOP web domains. Last month, U.S. Judge Solomon Oliver refused Connell's request to quash a subpoena connected to the lawsuit King Lincoln Bronzeville no- Neighborhood Association v. Blackwell and demanded his testimony relating to his IT work. In his deposition given in November, Connell denied any knowledge of vote rigging. Since his death Friday, the internet has buzzed with news about an IT entrepreneur, until now in the background of Republican politics, whose sudden death has sparked conspiracy theories and thrust him into the center of continuing controversies involving White House communications and electronic voting. Meanwhile, a man the Akron Beacon Journal recounts as a devout Catholic who organized annual missions to aid communities in El Salvador with as much passion as he devoted to the businesses he built, leaves behind his wife of 18 years and four children. End quote. Curiouser and curiouser. So for no reason that has ever been adequately explained, the servers hosting Ohio's county election offices reporting websites were routed through servers based at SmartTech's offices in Chattanooga, Tennessee, late in the evening as Kerry was beginning to win in Ohio, and suddenly Bush ended up winning uh, by a surprising margin. And we started to get stories about how exit polls, although they have always given a good indicator of who is going to win the race, suddenly and mysteriously, and for no good reason, since the introduction of vote counting machines, has suddenly stopped providing accurate election results. That's a very interesting coincidence, now isn't it? Well, certainly, this is a very important part of this whole puzzle, who Connell was, what his company was doing, and how this was affected. So let's take a look at it from a couple of different angles. First, let's just take a look at a good overall uh, view of what was happening there and how this plays into the bigger question of vote fraud. So we're going to listen to the trailer for a documentary called Free for All, The High-Tech Hijack of Ohio. And I can't say I can recommend this uh, documentary as a whole because I have not seen it all, but I have watched this trailer, which does, I think, put a very good, a good amount of material down into a very short amount of time that really links this all into the widespread fraud that was taking place in the vote counting machines in Ohio in 2004. How did these unsophisticated voting machines end up all over Ohio for the 2004 elections? And why are they still being used here in 2006? It's an organization that operates very close to the vest. It's a big company in Ohio, and, uh, and, you know, and they know what they, uh, and they protect their interests. In August 2003, Diebold CEO Wally Odell attended a strategy meeting at President Bush's ranch in Crawford, Texas. I would have attended, but my schedule was packed. A week later, Wally invited 100 people to his mansion in Upper Arlington, Ohio for a $1,000 a plate fundraiser, writing that he was committed to helping Ohio deliver its electoral votes to the president next year. The next day, Republican Secretary of State Ken Blackwell authorized Diebold to be one of three electronic voting machines in Ohio's 2004 election in a contract worth $100 million. He was promptly sued by another manufacturer for unfairly favoring Diebold in the bidding process. Ken Blackwell's financial disclosure forms later revealed that he owned 178 shares of stock in Diebold. This is a conflict of interest. In most states, if you're holding somebody stock and you negotiate a unbid contract with them, you go to jail. 
in Ohio, you apparently get to run for governor. But besides voting machines, Diebold also makes machines that count paper ballots, tabulate votes, and more. And there's all of these other voting machine companies in America, ESNS, Sequoia, Hart InterCivic, who are no better and who are in many cases even worse companies. Something I was realizing was that Ohio and many other states have been increasingly farming out the jobs of our elections to private corporations. We have a new gimmick in America. It used to be that, that we the people would handle our own elections. We would elect the government, which would then handle elections. Now we've privatized it. We've put it out to bid, just like the contracts in Iraq. Okay? And like the contracts in Iraq where the money goes missing, here the votes seem to go missing. You're not supposed to see this. This is a this is a proprietary printout sheet of a private company that's tallying the votes. So as we send out to private companies the tally for the vote, all the precincts go in, and a private company adds it all up. And we hope that our votes influence their decision. Okay, this is uh, Precinct 9D in a county in New Mexico. And there's the Bush Cheney total, there's the Cobb total. I don't know who Perutka is, Darnick and Nader. Where's John? Oh, John Kerry. There's no John. Yeah, I remember he ran for president. He's not on, he's not listed, okay? He's been electronically zapped. Not there. So you don't know that. The totals come out and you don't get this sheet. And where did you get it then? Well, we get, that's called investigative reporting. People slip it out the back doors to me. Unfortunately, then, people say I'm courageous. That's not true. It's the people that turn this stuff over to me that are courageous. This privatization and corporatization of secret software that nobody can ever see how they work. Even the people who use the systems, the election officials, they don't have a clue. Voting is not a commercial enterprise. It's not supposed to be a for-profit operation. You can fire your elected officials. You can look at their processes using the Freedom of Information Act. You can't file a Freedom of Information Act on the private contractors. These guys know it. It's completely 100% faith-based voting. Um, and it's, you know, like waiting every four years for the uh, magical election fairy to come down and tell us who won. And we're all supposed to go, oh, okay. And in Ohio, Ken Blackwell's privatization of elections was state of the art. Blackwell outsourced his 2004 election results webpage to be designed and maintained by GovTech, a company run by Mike Connell, who has worked for the Bush family since the 80s. His other firm, New media serves a who's who of Republicans. Bush Cheney 2000, Bush Cheney 2004, Ohio Republican Party, Ohioans for Blackwell, Republican National Committee. A side project of Mike Connell's was the website Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. But the fact that the world got the Ohio election results from a website made by the same web designer smearing Bush's opponent wasn't the only suspect thing on election night the web servers for the election results in Ohio were suddenly moved in the middle of the night, I think around 1 a.m. or so, it moved from Ohio to Tennessee. The entire business of reporting these numbers on the web, where media and the rest of America actually take them from, was being run by this far right, wacko, partisan web server company. Some of the other websites that SmartTech was hosting were GeorgeWBush.com, RNC.org, GOP.com, OhioGOP.com, Newt.org, GingrichProductions.com, AmendForArnold.org. We shouldn't be surprised because you had such a far right-wing wacko as the Secretary of State, J. Kenneth Blackwell, in Ohio. So it was a little surprised that that's the sort of company that he would work with to oversee, in a fair and impartial manner, the uh, presidential election in Ohio in 2004. The election results might as well have been emailed to the Republican Party before being officially reported. And in the upcoming 2006 election, Ken Blackwell would be sending the results out of state to the same smart tech servers again. So, in 2004, Ken Blackwell, the man running the presidential election in Ohio, while co-chair of George Bush's campaign, certifies dubious voting machines from a guy who really wants Bush to win, sends the results out of state to the Bush campaign's servers, then reports the results through a website designed by a guy who's already making websites lying about Bush's opponent, with the only difference in 2006 being that it's now Ken Blackwell's own election. Does all of this 
give you confidence that the vote totals will totally not be tampered with. Well, let's not leave this hanging on a rhetorical question. The correct answer to that question is, of course, no. But I'm sure, as you'll be able to see from the tenor of that documentary and many of the other sources that I'll be citing in today's episode, a lot of the very good investigative journalism that was taking place on this issue of the vote fraud taking place in the electronic voting machines was done in the first eight years of the 21st century during the Bush administration. And oddly enough, during the few years of the Obama administration, a lot of those same websites just have not been as tenaciously and doggedly following this issue. And that's not to count, cast aspersions on the great work that some people have done on this topic in the past, but it is interesting that as long as our guys are in power, eh, it doesn't matter so much about the vote machines. But, uh, but as soon as the other side gets into power, let's look at it very closely. And that just goes to show that once again, two, two wings, same bird of prey, and it's coming to eat you. But let's move on from that point. I just wanted to make that observation just so that people know that I'm not here trying to push one side or the other in the phony left-right political debate. I am just going where the facts lead, and the facts lead to the fact that not only is voting a futile idea in a, in a number of different senses, as pointed out by people like Larkin Rose and Stefan Molyneux and other guests that I've had on the program, it is also futile in the f fact that you, your vote doesn't even count, even if you do want to vote for some slave master who will uh, allow you a little bit more freedom, it doesn't even matter which button you press, because ultimately it's who counts the votes that wins every single time. And that's the point of all of this. So once again, let's take a look at a little bit more technical detail about how this works. And I will recommend to you a very, very interesting hour-long conversation with a man named Stephen Spoonamore, uh, a, a man who is a card-carrying Republican. He's a lifelong Republican and an IT specialist who has, uh, he's a, a serial entrepreneur and has run a number of businesses. He also works in network security for credit cards, trying to prevent credit card fraud and uh, has become an expert on voting fraud um, more by default and being drawn into the issue than by uh, volition, I believe. But at any rate, a very interesting and quite in-depth hour-long conversation. It's up on YouTube uh, under the title Busting the Man in the Middle of Ohio Vote Rigging. And I would suggest you go and uh, listen to it. Very interesting, as I say, breaking down a lot of the technical detail of how this goes on. But let's just take a listen to an excerpt from this hour-long interview where Stephen Spoonamore is talking specifically about how governmental elections can be uh, rigged, can be hacked, and how smart tech may have accomplished exactly what has been alleged that Michael Connell's company was doing in the 2004 Ohio presidential elections. So this group in Thailand, very clever, had basically added a computer right here called a MIM, a man in the middle, and sometimes they're called kingpins. It, they're a kingpin if they also send out controls they're generally just called a man in the middle if they intercept information. Now what happened is they had all of Phuket, where all these people were vacationing, all this information was coming in, and they were basically watching for things that were not cards that they didn't want and not phone calls. This was a very cleverly controlled computer that understood what the transmission signal of a credit card charge looked like, and then would copy the whole thing. And then, what they would do is every single card that they wanted, they'd add $100 in charge to a casino, get the chips, and then cash the chips out. So then you come back from your vacation, you know, Miss, Mrs. Smith has come back to Long Island, and she gets the bill, and she goes to Mr. Smith and says, what night did you spend $100 at the casino? And he goes, I didn't spend $100 at the casino. You must have spent $100 at the casino. Remember this? She goes, I didn't spend $100, I spent $20, and my $20 charge is here. So then it becomes a question, do Mr. and Mrs. Smith want to call anyone and fight about a hundred dollars that they had on vacation that neither of them are really sure if they spent it or not. It was a very clever gang and they were doing it to 50, 60, 70, 80 cards a day. Right? That's a MIM. Now, let's say instead of wanting to intercept credit card charges, I wanted to change a vote. Well then, I just need to figure out, here's my voting machine out there and my voting machine has got people who drive it to the county tabulators, but I'm going to erase this and now go to an architecture that's closer. Now that you understand the process of how it happens, let's talk about how voting tends to happen. 
So we've got all these voting machines out here. This is, you know, this is my polling place. And then the voting machines generally have a human being, not always, but a human being takes them apart and gets a bucket of memory cards, basically. These are my memory cards. And then they physically drive to the county tabulator. And there's basically a series of computers involved now. So at the county, I basically will have a thing. It looks sort of like a printer, but it's got a slot. You stick the card in there. And then there's a, uh, a reader screen, and then there's some kind of transmission computer, which is usually some old Dell computer or something sitting there. Sorry, Dell, if it's not a Dell computer. Well, but it's whatever county computer they could get that's cheap that has the Windows CE system. So this is the first part of my network. And what they do is they put that in, and it reads the thing, and we look at the results, and then it adds it to the total tabulation. Then what happens is it transmits, again, through a local switch into a PBX, into an opto switch, through the optical switch up here, and then back out into a PBX, and back out into a um, another Dell computer that's at the Secretary of State's office that's the final state tabulation. That's how it happens. Now the question becomes, where would you want the MIM? And back now we're going to go specifically October, 2000, October 2004, Ohio. What I have asserted and if people think I'm wrong, great, we'll go to discovery. And, and as I've repeatedly said, if I'm wrong, in my job, I'm wrong 15, 20% of the time. Great, I was wrong. I didn't figure out where the thieves were. I admit it, we move on, we fix it. I'm right about 80% of the time, which is why a lot of companies hire me. What it looks like to me happened, and I said this, was that somebody had installed a kingpin which was taking not just, and now we'll go ahead and change colors here, see if my red pen works today. They were taking a kingpin, and I suggested the kingpin had to be out there. Uh, red's working okay today. So the kingpin, I thought, was probably sitting somewhere in the middle on the high speed line. And the kingpin is a computer with a person sitting at it, it doesn't just steal the information and then they use it later like we saw. It's a person who has on board their Kingkin computer the code and instructions for the Secretary of State's office and the code and instructions for a county tabulator. Now, as I said, most of these county tabulators, tons of them, are this extremely poorly designed architectures on relatively old software, it's very well established. There's tons of I mean, you guys can find lots of examples of people who've shown how to hack the code. But I'm not talking about the specific hack. I'm talking about the fact this guy has got copies of the code or has already introduced in these things routines that are communication routines to talk to his kingpin. So then what he does is he sits there and instead of this happening, this happens. And in addition to that data flow going through there, the control information in red to go back to these can be driven as well. So now what happens is county tabulates everything up, is constantly talking back and forth saying, I've got 10% of my vote. And the kingpin says, wonderful, what's the total? Now, you think you're talking to the Secretary of State, but you're not. You're talking to the kingpin. And then you say, it's this, and the kingpin says, Okay, great. And then it passes out to the Secretary of State. So the kingpin doesn't have to make itself seen. It can choose to pass everything through until it decides to say, ah, now I've got a problem. You know, so at nine o'clock in the evening, Carrie's leading in Ohio. And then the kingpin is watching these results go through. And this operator is sitting here at a company called Smart Tech Solutions. We now know. And, and remember, when I speculated this, everyone said, that's ridiculous, that's completely impossible. Well, we now found out that not only was I right, we know where it was sent. We didn't just have it introduced, it was designed into the Secretary of State's office that they could switch the control from their computer talking to the counties to have a smart tech do it. So, great, I was right. So now, everybody's saying, well, yeah, you were right, we're sending a smart tech, but they didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> well, then why were you sending it to them? So these guys at Smart Tech, they're now looking at the things going by, and they finally make a decision. We need more Bush votes. So what they started doing was, in counties where they already knew that it was a Republican county coordinator, 
They already knew they were going to win the county. They started padding the vote to cover the differences in the place that had been too dangerous and they would have gotten caught had they done it. So in these places, they were already heavily Republican. They would probably looked and said, okay, votes have come in from this precinct and we'll take away 50 carry votes and add 50 to Bush and then send it on. And then what's great is we'll then send back to the tabulator and change the tabulator level too, which is very simple to do. If you've ever called up the customer service help desk and all of a sudden watch them changing something inside your computer, you'll go, oh my gosh, how are they doing that? Well, it's because they have the ability to do it if you have the code of what's at both end, which we know the guys at Smart Tech had. So that's how I have repeatedly, first I speculated that's what it was, and then it was discovered in fact that this actual centerpiece existed. And then we found out who owned it. And then we also found out it's also doing Carl Rove's email. <laughs> like, that's brilliant. I mean, it's like, I'm humbled that that was that obvious. So, and of course now we'll find out as the uh, case moves along, whether or not anyone wants to do anything about it. But, you know, when you're working on a criminal case, and, I, and I've worked on tons of criminal cases, do the criminals have the means? Do they have a method? Do they have the motivation? Well, motivation, hmm, I want to steal the presidency because it's really powerful position, got it. Do I have the method? Well, this was the method I speculated existed when it happened and everyone said I was out of my mind. Well, we now have all the documentation to prove, yes, actually, the method was set up. And then do they have the means? As it turns out, at 9.32 in the evening on Election Day, October 2004, every county stopped reporting directly to Secretary of State and sent everything to this kingpin. And the kingpin then decided what was sent in each direction. Bang. In my world of credit cards, which is where I make my living, if I had speculated about this and even had one tiny shred of evidence, sitting across from me would not be find people like yourself who are documentary filmmakers, I'd have Secret Service and FBI lined up saying, how do we go get them? Because they all get feathers in their caps and get prizes and win. Instead, uh, there seems to be a deafening silence from the Department of Justice on these issues. But mm -hmm. uh, they're busy. They're very busy. They're hunting down all kinds of uh, child pornographers. And I mean, there's a lot of other people out there that are bad people. So this is just a low priority. I mean, it's just a democracy, so it's not particularly high priority. Well, all of this is highly interesting and highly suspicious and obviously deserves quite a bit of investigation. But let's tie this back into the main theme of today's episode, the plane crash that caused the death of Michael Connell in December 2008. And can we draw any sorts of lines or parallels or even valid questions to ask about that the downing of that plane in relation to this case? For example, were there any suggestions for that his life had been threatened in any way for, uh, if not coming forward willingly, at least being compelled to testify as a witness in potential cases against Karl Rove and others for racketeering in Ohio, which were really being planned at the time? And as mentioned before, he was deposed in November of 2008, in fact, the day before the 2008 presidential elections, in a case relating to the Ohio vote frauds, but he had not yet been called as a witness, and that was yet to come at the time of his death. So, was there any threats on the horizon? Well, certainly so. Coming from bradblog.com of May 2009, sisters of GOP IT guru Mike, o Mike Connell very suspicious about his death. It's hard not to believe there was something deliberate about it. Quote, The sisters of Michael Connell, a GOP IT consultant and former associate of Karl Rove who died in a plane crash last December, are now questioning the circumstances surrounding his death. Shannon Connell of Madison says her brother Michael rarely talked about work, a local Wisconsin paper reported Thursday. She knew he ran an Ohio company called New Media Communications that set up websites for Republicans, including former President George H.W. Bush and Florida Governor Jeb Bush. But it wasn't until after he died last December, when the small plane he was piloting crashed, that she learned via the internet of his tie to a voter fraud case and to allegations that presidential adviser Karl Rove had made threats against him. 
At first, it was really hard for me to believe Mike was dead because somebody wanted him dead, the paper quoted Shannon as saying. But as time goes on, it's hard for me not to believe there was something deliberate about it. A native of Illinois, Shannon moved to Madison in 2002, the paper adds, the same year as her sister, Mary Jo Walker. Walker, a former Dane County Humane Society employee, has similar concerns about their brother's death. It doesn't seem right to me at all. And another tidbit and noted in this Brad blog article from a report in Wisconsin's The Daily Page, Carl Rove case witness killed in plane crash, sisters want answers. Shannon and Mary Jo both say that their brother, a devout Catholic, seemed upset in the weeks before his death. Mary Jo feels he was stressed out and depressed on his birthday last November. Shannon says he atypically did not respond to an email she'd sent. Shannon Connell, for her part, dismisses reports that her brother was warned not to fly, but still considers the crash that killed him very suspicious. Michael was an experienced pilot, and his plane had recently been serviced. Plus, there's the timing, after the deposition and before the trial. It just seems very convenient. Well, for more on the threats that Michael Connell was alleged to have received from Karl Rove regarding his role in the cover-up and keeping his mouth shut, let's turn to an amazing, incredible report that came out not after, but five months before Michael Connell's death in July of 2008. And this one, also coming from bradblog.com, Rove threatened GOP IT guru if he did not take the fall for election fraud in Ohio, says attorney. Letter sent to Attorney General McCasey requesting protection for Mr. Connell and his family from this reported attempt to intimidate a witness after tip from credible source. Quote, Carl Rove has threatened a GOP high-tech guru and his wife if he does not take the fall for election fraud in Ohio, according to a letter sent this morning to Attorney General Michael McCasey by Ohio election attorney Cliff Arnebeck. The email, posted in full below, details threats against Mike Connell of the Republican firm New Media Communications, which describes itself on its website as a powerhouse in the field of Republican website development and internet services, and having played a strategic role in helping the GOP expand its technological supremacy. Connell was described in a recent interview with the plaintiff's attorney in Ohio as a high IQ Forrest Gump for his appearance at the scene of every GOP crime, from Florida 2000 to Ohio 2004, to the RNC email system, to the installation of the currently used Congressional Computer Network firewall. Connell and his firm are currently employed by the John McCain campaign as well as the RNC and other Republicans and the so-called faith-based organizations. In a phone call this afternoon, Arnebeck could not publicly reveal specific details of the information that triggered his concern about the threats to Connell. The message to the IT man from Rove is said to have been sent via a go-between in Ohio. The information led Arnebeck to contact McCasey after he found the reports to be credible and troubling. End quote. Well, that is a pretty amazing piece of this puzzle, isn't it? Before Connell even died in that plane crash, there was an attorney who was working on this incredibly high-profile case who had a credible threat against Connell's life and actually wrote to the attorney general asking for protection for this witness. And he goes and he's deposed in November, he's yet to be called as a witness in the case, and he ends up dying in this plane crash. And as noted in that article, at the time of that article, Arnebeck was not able to comment on the, uh, the specifics of the threats or give any details about it. Well, he was able to give a bit more detail shortly after Connell's death in December of 2008, when Peter B. Collins of the Peter B. Collins Show had him on for his December 22nd, 2008 broadcast. Special coverage of the airplane crash that took the life of Republican computer guru Mike Connell on Friday night in Akron, Ohio. We're talking with Brad Friedman from bradblog.com and Cliff Arnbeck, the attorney from Columbus, who deposed Mike Connell. That's right, he took a deposition, that's what that means. On the day before our November 4th elections, just this past year, and uh, we'll get the attorney on the line shortly here. I think he made an appearance on Lou Dobbs' program tonight, and uh, so he will be checking back with us uh, as soon as he clears there. Um, Brad, I-, I wanted to just see if there's anything you want to add before we go to Cliff Arnbeck here. Yeah, well, yeah, well I've, I've uh, noticed that one point that was made, uh, I'm not sure if it was a commenter or an emailer, but one, one curious uh, note here is that 
as uh, high ranking as Mike Connell was, and with you know having worked on Bush's campaign and uh, uh, McCain's campaign and the email system and everything else, isn't it curious that there has been no statement, to my knowledge, on the passing of Mike Connell coming out of the White House or from Karl Rove or anybody else at this point? Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you know, you would think. Uh, I, I suspect that he even had uh, uh, Jack Amer- Abramoff met an untimely death. That there would have been some <laughs> form of recognition from the White House, but uh, in this Connell case, absolutely nothing. Uh huh. Very interesting. Well, I think that is an important point to raise, and as we uh, follow this story, it'll be very interesting to see if there is acknowledgement from the White House uh, on these issues. And I just learned that uh, Cliff Arnbeck will be on Lou Dobbs tomorrow, so we've got that straightened out. Mr. Arnbeck, welcome back to our program. Nice to talk with you again. Nice to be with you, Peter. And uh, Brad Friedman is with us as well. I know you two have spoken because uh, Brad's interview with you is up at bradblog.com. Howdy, Brad. Good to talk to you. So, Cliff, um, uh, what would you like? To, where, where would you like to start? We've discussed the incident. We've discussed the uh, history of Mike Connell. Um, I'd like to ask you to comment on the warnings that were uh, issued to Mike Connell about his life, that have been attributed to Carl Rove, and the un- unusual steps that you took, asking judges, or at least one judge, uh, to protect Mike Connell from the threats that had been made. Well, there were two. Uh... Two threats. Uh, the first came. The first came shortly after uh, the news conference we had July 17th this year, uh, where we identified Connell as a key witness uh, against Carl Rove. I apologize for that feedback. I'll try to fix that. Keep talking. And um, and the tip uh, the tipster said that uh, Rove was threatening Connell uh, and uh, indicating that he would not be. Uh, uh, given uh, a pardon, and that his wife, uh, Heather, would be uh, prosecuted if he implicated uh, Rove or anyone uh, else uh, in, in this, that he was to take the fall. Mm-hmm. And, and then later on, there were, there were a, 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 a two or three additional tips, and then closer to the time of the actual deposition, uh, the tipster indicated that uh, Rove... No, that uh, the tipster said Connell is in danger, mm-hmm. and uh, that was more, more ominous in its tone than the original tip talking about uh, the threat of prosecution of, of the wife. And do you know how these threats were delivered? Uh, our understanding from the tipster is that they were not delivered uh, directly from uh, Rove to Connell, but rather through Jeff Aberbeck. Mm-hmm. And who is Jeff? Jeff? Jeff Averbeck is the president of Smart Tech. I see. Okay. And uh, did Mike Connell take these threats seriously? Well, the uh, tipster uh, uh, didn't didn't uh, say anything about that um, <clears throat> because they were they were uh, deemed to be credible by uh, the people uh, who have uh, knowledge of uh, of the players and knowledge of the situation. Uh, we uh, took them as uh, as serious threats, and uh, that's why we communicated to uh, the Attorney General of the United States, to the Attorney General of the State of Ohio, and to the federal court in which we had a pending case where we had de- designated Connell as a witness. Mm-hmm. And we basically said that uh, a witness that we've identified uh, in the, in this uh, for purposes of this federal litigation is being subjected to intimidation, and we ask that everything be done to uh, to uh, protect the witness. And what was the response from first Attorney General Mukasey's office and then the Ohio Attorney General? Well, the Ohio Attorney General uh, agreed at, at that point to uh, uh, to lift the stay uh, to lift the stay in the case that we had pending in federal court, uh, and to. Uh, uh, specifically for the purpose of taking the deposition of Michael Connell. And, and, uh, so that was their response. It was to get, bring him into the court system, uh, through, uh, the discovery process. Mm-hmm. Uh, the U.S. Attorney General, we did not he- have a response, but, uh, I began to communicate with the, um, uh, a high official there who, whom I know personally, 
Um, and when I when I called his office, uh, there was the, his uh, secretary was very cordial, seemed to be familiar uh, enough that she gave me his direct telephone number and his uh, email. So I have been emailing him information, information keeping him informed about this. Mm -hmm. And my thought was that if uh, probably Rove would know, uh, because we were reporting uh, broadly that we were we were advising the Justice Department, uh, and as much as Rove has been a target of the uh, Patrick Fitzgerald inquiry as special counsel into the uh, Wilson Plain matter, mm -hmm. and is now a target on the on the uh, U.S. Firing, attorneys firing of the U.S. attorneys right. and the. Uh, politicization of the Justice Department, I thought that by by bring, uh, keeping this uh, in in the sights of the Justice Department that we were uh, protecting uh, Connell from any harm. Some absolutely incredible information, and I certainly hope that the listeners out there will not think I'm stepping too far out on the limb to say that this is definitely turning into a case that is worthy of some serious investigation. We have a very high-profile person with potentially some very inside knowledge about some very, very illegal shenanigans going on in the elections, and he was openly on the record having been threatened and there was legal protection that was actually requested for him and his family. He ends up dying in a plane crash before he could become a witness in a very high-profile case. Very, very interesting indeed. So we have the characters involved and we have their, their relation to each other and what motivation there would have been for staging some sort of fiery plane crash which, of course, leads us coming back to the question about the plane crash itself. Was there anything untoward about that? And was there anything from the reports that have come out since that would suggest there was any foul play involved? Well, for the basics of what uh, took place or what is reported to have taken place on that night in December 2008, we can turn to the final report of the NTSB, which filed its probable cause report on January 28th, 2010 in the case. And it has a narrative laid out of exactly what happened in this case. And it reads, quote, The pilot obtained a weather briefing prior to the flight to Akron Ken Regional Airport, Ohio, from College Park, Maryland. During the briefing, the pilot proposed a route of flight to an altitude of 6,000 feet. The briefer told the pilot that the freezing level at CAK at the time of briefing was about 3,000 to 4,000 feet, but that it may drop to the surface as the day progressed. The pilot indicated at the beginning of the 20-minute briefing that he was aware of the hazardous weather conditions and he expressed concern about them, but he decided to depart to CAK shortly after he received the briefing. At the time of the accident, weather observations at CAK indicated broken clouds at 500 feet above ground level and overcast skies at 100 feet above ground level. Meteorological analysis showed a high likelihood of encountering supercooled large droplet icing in the area, General aviation pilots operating into and out of the CAK surrounding t the time of the accident all reported icing conditions, with most of the icing occurring between 3,000 to 3,500 feet. The reports also indicated freezing rain. Three of the pilots reported a rapid accumulation of between 1 and 2 inches of ice within a 15-minute period prior to and after the accident. One pilot re reported that he required a significant amount of engine power to maintain airspeed and had a hard landing due to ice accumulation on his airplane. As the accident airplane approached CAK, the local air traffic controller issued the pilot a vector to the instrument landing system localizer course about two miles from the runway's ILS outer marker. The controller advised the pilot to maintain 3,200 feet until established on the approach, and that the airplane was cleared for the approach. The pilot acknowledged and asked if there were any pilot reports of icing below 6,000 feet in the area. The controller responded that there was no reports of icing at the time, but asked the pilot to advise if he encountered any. The pilot did not report icing conditions. The pilot made a gradual left turn to intercept the localizer and then leveled out near the approach course heading. Although left of the localizer course, he began descending on the approach and stabilized the airplane at an airspeed of just over 100 knots. The controller told the pilot that he was left of the approach course centerline. The pilot acknowledged and reported that he was correcting. Recorded radar track information showed that the pilot did not correct to the right, but continued to fly a course to the left of and almost parallel to the approach course centerline. The controller then told the pilot that he was well left of the approach course. The airplane briefly turned right toward the approach course centerline, but seconds later the airplane rolled into about a 30 degree left bank and began turning away from the approach course centerline. 
While at 2,800 feet, the pilot requested clearance to perform a non-standard 360-degree turn while about two and a half miles northeast of the airport in order to re-establish the airplane on the approach course. The pilot had commenced the turn before hearing back from the controller. The controller responded that he was unable to approve the pilot's request. The controller then instructed the pilot to climb and maintain 3,000 feet. The airplane's left bank gradually increased to about 40 degrees at that time. The controller asked the pilot for his present heading, and the pilot responded, due north and climbing. The airplane began to climb while remaining at a 30 to 40 degree left bank. The controller instructed the pilot to climb without delay. Pitch increased above 20 degrees with the airplane still in the 30 degree left bank and with airspeed significantly decreasing. Shortly thereafter, the airplane entered a spiral-like dive as the pilot declared an emergency. The controller advised the pilot to maintain altitude. The airport is two miles west of you. But the pilot did not respond and there was no further contact with the airplane. During these last radio transmissions, the airplane was a continu- in a continuous left turn with decreasing radius until it abruptly dropped off the radar. A ground witness saw two bright lights coming along nose first towards the ground with the engine roaring. The airplane impacted the ground in a nose down and left wing low altitude. Post accident examination of the airplane revealed no anomalies that would have precluded normal operation. An NTSB sound spectrum study of digital audio recording of ATC communications indicated normal engine operation, etc., etc. Eventually, what uh, the NTSB concludes contributed to the accident were the pilot's decision to conduct flight into known icing conditions, ice accumulation that reduced the airplane's aerodynamic performance, and the pilot's failure to initially intercept and establish the airplane on the proper approach course. So, where does that leave us? Well, I, if you're like me, none of that will make a lot of sense to you because I have never flown a... Well, I've flown a plane briefly for a few seconds, but that's another story. I, I'm not really experienced as a pilot or know much about piloting a Piper, so I'm not really sure what to make of the talk about the the degrees banking away from the center line and the icing on the wings, etc. So I will leave that to you to explore more fully by taking a look at the uh, NTSB report for yourself. I will also throw a link into a very interesting thread on democraticunderground.com where commentators who at least claim to be far more knowledgeable than myself talk about the uh, implications of some of the parts of this uh, report and some of the icing and other things that the NTSB is attempting to blame this crash on. So a lot of interesting information to take a look at, and I don't presume to have the answers on that one, so I will let you do that on your own time. But I would like to point you to a very interesting article called The Mysterious Death of Bush's Cyber Guru Michael Connell, which actually appeared in Maxim magazine, of all places, back in 2010, and it was penned by Simon Worall. And I'll just read, I think, a very interesting part along the lines of what caused the crash of this flight. Uh, From the end of that article, it says, quote, Clouding matters further is the persistent specter of paranoid conspiracy that has enveloped the case from the beginning. In September 2009, an anonymous letter was sent to the FBI in Ohio and five other addresses, including Heather Connell. Enclosed is a document that is not meant to exist, begins the anonymous writer. Included is what purports to be an after-action report by a black ops agent. All names have been redacted, but the report provides a detailed time log of actions taken to install an AMD microprocessor in the engine of Connell's plane at College Park Airfield in D.C. the night before he made his fatal last flight. Connell himself is not mentioned by name. Just the registration number of his plane, NP299N, which the agent confirms he has been sent to neutralize. The letter accompanying the report is headed, Michael Connell, Homicide. It ends with the words, Connell was not NST, National Security Threat. While skeptics may be tempted to dismiss these documents as the ingenious work of a hoaxer intent on pouring gasoline on the bonfire of conspiracy theories already surrounding Connell, a number of experts from the intelligence community who have seen the document believe it to be genuine. In early November, the NTSB finally released its factual report into Connell's crash, The report concludes that tests carried out on the plane's engine, flight control, and autopilot systems revealed no anomalies that would have precluded normal operation. A spokeswoman for the NTSB confirmed that the organization had received a copy of the anonymous letter, but would not say whether its claims were being looked into. We're investigating the accident, she says, not any possible criminal activity. 
She adds that the NTSB forwarded the letter to the FBI in Cleveland. When asked to confirm this, Scott Wilson at the FBI's Cleveland Bureau says, The only thing I can say is, I can't say anything. Ultimately, only a full criminal investigation can determine the truth about Ohio 04 and the death of Michael Connell. Robert Kennedy Jr., who sought Connell's cop cooperation during an investigation into the election, believes the current administration should pursue the matter. I think this is more serious than Watergate, he says. Watergate was essentially about winning the battle for public opinion. That's why the break-in took place, to gather strategic information about democratic strategy and dirt. But the electoral process remained intact. The Ohio vote undermines the very foundation stone of American democracy. There should be an official investigation. Otherwise, this becomes a blueprint for how to steal an election from here to eternity. That may not be enough for Connell's widow. When I first spoke to her on the phone, Heather Connell was adamant that her husband's plane crash had been an accident, God's will. But she is no longer so sure. This is a messed up case of whether Karl Rove threatened my husband or not, she says. I ask her directly if she now believes her husband could have been murdered. She takes a deep drag of her cigarette and, choking back tears, says, I don't know. I don't know. End quote. Well, friends, this is a very, 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 very deep case that goes into some of the highest quarters of the previous administration, the puppet administration that was put into place by, as all accounts seem to point to, complete and total voter fraud. And how can we be sure of the results of any election from here to eternity, as RFK says at the end of that article, if we cannot be sure of what happened, for example, in Ohio in 04? And if they can stage a plane crash to get away with murder to cover up what they did, then what are they not capable of doing? And so I leave this podcast here, as always, in your hands, armed with the links and information that I provided in the documentation section for this episode, so that you can go out, examine the source documents, examine what has been said about this case, and come to your own conclusions. But might I, as a Canadian citizen living here in Japan, be so bold as to suggest for the Americans in the crowd that during this election cycle, perhaps stories like these should be given more attention? And on that note, we'll leave it here for today. I am your host, James Corbett, thanking you for joining me, reminding you that if you appreciate the Corbett Report and the information I'm providing here, it is brought to you by yourself. So your subscriptions and your DVD orders are greatly appreciated. And of course, the best thing that anyone can do is to help to spread the word about this information. So thank you for joining me for this episode of The Corbett Report, and I look forward to talking to you again next week. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.